Okay, so I will. I'll just turn it off there. Fantastic. So I'm going to start off with a quote from a, a science fiction author, um, a guy called William Gibson. I'm sure many of you, the older people in the room, might have read some of his books, Neuromancer, um, Johnny Mnemonic. Um, he's kind of seen as one of the main people that come up with the notion of cyberspace. If you watch The Matrix, a lot of his ideas and thoughts are in there as well. Very influential author, um, science fiction author. And he has a famous quote that, that says, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. And I've always found this quote really interesting. And, and there's, there's kind of two meanings to it. The first meaning, when I was younger, it was, I always interpreted it as being about entrepreneurial ability, how technology can change the world and how it's possible for us to invent the future. And then we just need to get more people to use it. So it was a lot about technology adoption and getting people to use things uh, and very much in that kind of startup kind of ecosystem. But as I've gotten older and as our society has changed as well, I, I, I've seen the other interpretations of this and, and others have recognized this as well, um, that th th there's different meanings potentially here as well, that the future is here, but it's not evenly distributed. Not everyone has access to the future or maybe somebody else is uh, inventing the future or maybe somebody else is defining what your future is because it's not evenly distributed. Not everyone can get access to it. And I find that, that that's a very interesting way of looking at, at this quote as well that has a, has a different meaning and has different types of challenges. Um, when we look at our world today, we have all of these smart environments that are coming out and we're all familiar with them. This is a, specifically a workshop on smart cities. So you, you, everyone knows about the notion of using ICT to try to optimize our world, whether it's water or buildings, energy, agriculture, cities. This is a, a key trend and it's, it's a very important societal trend that we all recognize that it needs to happen. Typically, when we look at these systems, the, the common metaphor that we talk about now is the notion of the digital twin, because it makes it nice and simple for people to understand it. We're trying to create digital replicas of the real world, gather our, our, our data on it, observe, see what makes sense, oriented to, to make sure that we have it in, in the appropriate places, study it, to, um, analyze it to make decisions, and then try to change the real world. So whether this is optimizing a car for performance or a city or a water network, th this is a common metaphor that we have. But as people that are trying to build these systems, we know these are not that simple to build. The first challenge that we have is that, well, everyone wants to have connected intelligent infrastructure. That's great. Um, but that infrastructure itself comes in different ways and it's built using different types of information systems. So keeping the, the, the notion of the car, you can have smart infrastructure that connects to the car as well, handling things like traffic management, charging stations, uh, ro uh, uh, road management. You can have other information systems that are targeting the occupants of the car in terms of their entertainment, maybe providing them with relevant information that's needed for, for their jobs, whether if they're going to a business meeting, they might need information on that meeting, or if, if there's kids in the car, maybe the parents need help entertaining them. And you can build lots of services around this, but the notion of, of, of these intelligent um, smart environments is all about connecting um, this data together and, and basically using that data to drive intelligence whether that, that's industrial data, personal data, open data, it's all this mash of data. When we dive down in, into looking at these systems, well, most of these systems have been developed independently. Um, our, our, our challenge that we have when we want to, to actually build these um, intelligent systems is that we have multiple systems to, uh, developed independently. And, we, and you know the systems engineering community have recognized this for a long time. And they, they talk about systems of systems engineering and the challenges that you have with interoperability there of bringing together different systems that weren't designed to work together to suddenly have to work together now. And, and this is a, a common challenge that we, that, that, that we know and we recognize. Um, and, and for us to actually be able to achieve this vision, this is something that, that we need to grapple with as a first class citizen when we look at our problems. When it comes to interoperability, the, the, the key barriers there are on, on the protocol side, which we've made much progress on. Most of our standardization focuses on the protocols that allow us to have interoperability between systems. But then when we look at the semantics and the meaning of the data that's been exchanged, it's still very, very costly to do that. that there is some standardization there, but it's very, very um, um, uh, elementary. And it's an incredibly difficult problem. To, stand, uh, to, to introduce standards for data that allows universal semantics of them. There's some very uh, in, inherent challenges with that. So, so when we look at the challenges that we face there, we, we recognize, yes, there's technology challenges, but there's also other challenges as well. This is a, an ecosystem of systems that have been developed. Um, and, and why do we talk about a, an ecosystem of systems? Well, interestingly, when we look at the, the physical environment, this notion of the ecosystem only emerged 
little over a little under a hundred years ago. A guy called uh, Tansley was looking at trying to understand from a biological point of view and, and an environmental point of view the different interactions that happen within the the natural ecosystem, whether it's plants, um, organisms. Uh, the physical environment and how they work together to be able to to develop the ecosystem and how they adapt and how they change but there's no major designer of an ecosystem and ecosystems change uh, for different reasons whether it's climate change or other ones but but the the ecosystem itself uh, works without that grand coordinator at the top this has been used within the the digital sphere to talk about data ecosystems or digital ecosystems and this helps us to be able to model ourselves as a socio-technical system where, where we're trying to say a data ecosystem is where you're working together to extract value from different value chains that exist across organizations and different types of, of individuals. So it's actually a very useful metaphor because we're not talking about trying to design a, a, a system or to build a system, a centralized system in a top-down manner, but you're recognizing the fact that you have this ecosystem, you have this interplay between it, you have different actors, different stakeholders, and you need to try to manage it as, as, an, as an ecosystem itself. Um, and data ecosystems exist all across the world. They can exist around individual businesses, and they can exist between communities, they can exist between collections of organizations. Some of them are oriented towards business purposes. Some of them are oriented towards societal purposes. They can have a, a marketplace scenario where there's um, the selling um, and trading of data. There can be competition between different data providers or different data services. There can be collaboration that happens there. But this is a very useful metaphor to understand this complexity that we have uh, in these smart environments. So but what I want to talk to you about is what's the state of the art, the state of play that, that that's um, currently there in smart environments. And, and this is a project, a European project that I want to talk about a little bit to, to see how, how good are we at managing data, data ecosystems. It's called Transforming Transport. It was a... 15 million euro project, had about 60 partners, and it basically looked at 22 different data ecosystems across Europe with multiple uh, organizations that were working together to optimize different types of transport and logistics use cases. So everything from package delivery to airports, to freight ports, to, to seaports, to uh, smart, uh, smart highways, to uh, buses, trains, everything you can imagine in terms of different types of pilots, looking at that data ecosystem of, of different systems that existed around and how did you how could we enable data sharing between them how could we connect them so that they could work in that system of systems type manner this is a, a high level analysis that was done at the end to try to, to capture some of the uh, learnings that, that came from from uh, transforming transport the great thing, I, I would say transforming transport is is effectively the state of practice it, it, it is as, as good as you can get today um, in industry for this type of work um, and a very clear message that came out of it was the need and the cost that's required to actually initially set up these um, smart infrastructures and this um, the, the data sharing that's required between different ecosystems, sorry, uh, within ecosystems. So what we find here is that you, you start off with your raw data and you have to go through a various set of different steps to be able to extract the value from that, whether it's, it's uh, data cleaning, data preparation, before you can even get to your machine learning stages, before you can get to any kind of post-processing visualization, before you can extract any value or insights for your use cases. And what you see here is that at the start of this chain on the left, the effort that's required to invest is actually quite high, but the return on value is actually quite low. And the reason for this is that uh, basically the cost of data management and sharing that data and making it interoperable and preparing it is incredibly high. And when you look at data, um, data analytics projects, machine learning projects, AI-based uh, projects, anything from 40 to 80% of the cost is in data preparation in industry. And that's a significant challenge for a lot of organizations. So the, the barrier that they clearly identified and that we experienced here is that there needs to be significant investment in the infrastructure before you get to the point where you can start pulling out uh, value from it. And from a business point of view, that can be quite challenging for a lot of different organizations. Um, and just, just to point out, like, I would say Transforming Transport was a medium-sized project. So we had um, 164 terabytes of data that was shared across 160 different data sources. So it wasn't incredibly massive scale, but it, but it, was, it was quite focused. And, and this challenge was quite, um, quite prevalent and, and it was repeated many, many times, the cost of, of investing in those early stages of the data analysis pipeline uh, was a significant challenge. The way that Transforming Transport tackled this, and, and it was, as I say, I would say it's state of the art, they had a, a data catalog that basically 
um, identified all of the different data assets that they had. It was machine readable. Each data set would have its own ID card. And they use this notion of a, of a sieve to try to understand, well, we have all of this data. What are the, the data assets that we understand in more detail? Uh, and then we'll narrow it down further again to say, well, what are the data assets that we're actually using in our use cases? So they use this notion of a sieve uh, within their data catalog to kind of look through the stream of data that was being created to basically try to find the nuggets of gold that are there. And that, that, that's effectively um, that's effectively what they've done. And it, 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 it's fantastic. It's a great project. But when we think back to the notion of smart environments and what we want to do with our planet and the challenge that we have, you know, what we really need is much more industrial scale mining of this. We, 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 we can't have this notion of people sitting down, manually crafting and working with data on a very, very low granular level when, when actually the amount of data that we want to analyze is very, very significant. And we, we need to be able to do that in a very industrialized way. We shouldn't have to, to do this panhandling. We need more scale. And this, this goes back to the fundamental challenge that we have is that we're now looking at data as, as a global resource for the world. The Economist, a uh, UK-based magazine had this, I think it was uh, about two years ago, three years ago, that talked about basically potentially the most valuable resource that we have in the world now is data. However, there's significant challenges around competition to it. And they identified large data companies that have that very strategic advantage. So when we think about that future and, and having access to data, if the ability to be competitive commercially or as a society or as a city comes back to your level of access to data, well, do we actually have access to our data today? How easy is it for you to go and access your data? Quite challenging. You know, you might be able to export it, but could you move it easily between different organizations? Can you move it to the apps that you wanted? Mm, it's challenging. So if you were to look at this from, from a flow point of view, we're excellent at generating data. We're really, really good. Uh, IoT has been a fantastic success. It's going to continue to be more successful. We're really good at analyzing data. We can build models. We can understand how to use those models to make business decisions for cities, for organizations, for individuals, for health. We're really good at this. But what we're missing is the ability to move it easily from source to that decision-making point. And, and that's really the challenge that we're missing is these data platforms that make it easier to transport that data from where we create it to where we need to be able to make those decisions. And we have lots of designs for it, but, but there's some fundamental challenges in, in how we need to build these platforms so that they can scale to the level that we need within our society to do that. And that, that's a little bit about the, the context of the talk that I have today. So, so when I look at this from a stack, this is, a, this is a, one of those highly uh, cited papers on, on Internet of Things from a, a Tesori. Um, I think it's got three or 4,000 sites, but it gives this common stack that you expect for, for, for your IoT. You have your, um, you have your first layer, communication and sensing, then you have your middleware platforms, uh, streaming, probably subscribe, service-oriented architectures, SDNs, and then you have a higher level um, uh, application layer where all our users are working on it. And what I'm saying is that we actually, we're actually missing a layer here. We actually need more formal ways, more support for actually sharing um, and supporting the sharing of data between different applications as well. So is it a type of middleware? Yes, but the, the point I'm trying to make here is that we need a specific layer that just looks at data sharing and the semantics that are associated with that, and then look at the different support services that come from it. And I think it, it's so important that today we talk a lot about open data initiatives, and, and this is a good start. An open data initiative is something that allows us to be able to share primarily mostly government data between different uh, stakeholders. But this has to evolve. This has to move to the next level. We need to start thinking about what's a public data infrastructure that we could actually have within our city or within our societies. And I believe that, that forward, forward thinking societies will see the provision of this type of digital infrastructure as the same as any other type of shared societal service, whether it's water, sanitation, education, healthcare. You'll be saying, where's my public data infrastructure for my society as well? And I believe that's something that we need to develop. The good news is, within Europe at least, um, within our, our data strategy that was released last year, the Commission as well also recognised this, that the challenge of, of how do we share data at scale within Europe. And, and particularly within Europe, we do not have large data companies. So those data companies that I talked about, that The Economist talked about, Google and Amazon, et cetera, et cetera, none of them are European. We do not have those large data companies. And the European strategy to, to, to counter this is, is to look at this notion of, of common European data spaces. So basically, how do we provide a common infrastructure to Europe that allows different sectors, different regions, 
uh, individuals, organizations to come together to be able to share their data so that they can actually improve access to it, that they can sell their data, that they can sell their insights. Um, and how do we organize that around publicly provisioned infrastructure as opposed to it being provisioned by the private sector or purely by the government? So it's more of a, a societal provision of that infrastructure. And this is the, the core of, of what um, the commission want to do. So, so basically the, 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 the notion of, of, uh, of data spaces um, provides this opportunity for this shared societal infrastructure. However, the challenge that we have is, well, do we actually know how to build these? Okay, do we have to build them in the same way as we, we've built them before? And, and that's really where my research has been for the kind of the last decade is looking at, you know, alternative ways of being able to build large scale data infrastructures. And, and the work I've, um, that I'm going to present now at a very high level is the notion of real time linked uh, data spaces. So when we look at a traditional approach to data integration, this is a, um, a, an analysis of, of basically all the data that we would collect. When, when we actually study the data that we collect, we, we find we have a long tail. So we have a lot of data um, that we use quite frequently. And then we have this long tail of data um, that we still need to manage. However, when we look at how traditional data, uh, data management infrastructure um, does this, basically the challenge that we have is that it's designed to, to work with the head of that tail. There's a scalability um, issue and challenge when we actually want to work with, with existing data technologies like relational databases to do this. So the more data you add to it, actually the more costly and the more challenging it becomes to actually work with because of the complexity uh, associated with the data and the models. The reasons for this is that the world has changed drastically since we, uh, since we actually invented that technology. If, if I was given this presentation at Middleware in Rio in 2004, we'd have been talking about entities that might have had tens or hundreds of attributes. You could probably fit them into a table. You could probably even maybe show them on a single screen. And in the 20 years since, you've suddenly got entities that have thousands, potentially millions of attributes. And if you look at a building, a smart building, all of the different pieces of that building can be modeled as part of a, a digital twin. Uh, and suddenly you get incredibly complex models. Um, and, and basically the, the, the notion of a, of a fixed schema goes out the window. You have these very dynamic schemas that change and that evolve over time that are created in fundamentally decentralized ways. And, and, and the, the, the other significant challenge is that, that once you move the, the data model away from the, the view of an individual person, you have different perspectives. You have conflicting um, perspectives on the world, different conceptualizations of reality, different types of challenges, ambiguity, vagueness, inconsistency, but potentially all valid because you can have different people view the world in different ways, but equally valid ways. This isn't, this isn't necessarily a case of, of uh, different truths or, 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 or uh, factfulness, but it, it's a notion of people can just conceptualize the world in, in equally valid ways from different perspectives. And that gets reflected in their data. And that creates this fundamental data management challenge that we have. So if any of you are familiar with Lewis Carroll, he wrote Alice in Wonderland, and there was a character in Alice in Wonderland called the Red Queen. And the Red Queen used to run the spot. And Alice talked to the Red Queen, why, why are you running there? Well, if I, do, if I stop running, I'll fall back. So the, the notion of having to constantly run um, became this Red Queen hypothesis. It becomes part of, of evolutionary theory as well, the notion that you have survival of the fittest. And if you want to keep surviving, you got to keep running, you, you got to keep moving. And from a data management point of view, this is what we've been doing. OK, I, I, if, if you're if you've been working in the data management space, we've been constantly trying to develop technologies that can keep that can cope with the data that's been created by society. And the reality is we've actually never gotten to the point where we're, we're actually able to manage effectively the data that's been created um, by our systems. It, it's just we've just never been there. We're always losing this race. We're always trying to catch up to it. So so what, what's the approach? How, how would data spaces, real time uh, linked data spaces change this? Well. The reality is, is that we've had these challenges before in the past. Um, for anyone in the room that recognizes this page, if, if you were alive in 1995, this was the internet. This was Yahoo. If you wanted to go on the internet, you would go to this website. Um, probably half people in the room recognize this, the other half don't. But this was the internet uh, 25 years ago. Effectively, you go, you type in, um, you, you, you go and you basically have a directory of all the websites. There was 100,000 websites at the time. It click on a link, it would come back and it would give you these six or seven. If I've, I'm, I'm a Liverpool soccer fan. I could go here, I could find a category on Liverpool, click, and I get these six great websites that talked about Liverpool. And it was amazing. 
Um, and this worked really well. It gave you exact results. I click on what I want, exactly what I want, and it gives me back high quality, exact results. But this is effectively a human created taxonomy that was there at the time. And Yahoo became one of the biggest companies in the world effectively based on this. Incredibly effective. Three years later, the web went from about 100,000 websites to two and a half million websites. And suddenly the ability for Yahoo to actually provide high quality results diminished drastically because they had this human created approach. Google came along and they basically did the search box dominated. And you can see drastically the difference there. The taxonomy is gone straight away. And with Yahoo, you'd go and everyone, everyone knows Yahoo. You drop in your keywords, you hit search, and you get back a list of results. And that list of results is approximate. They're not exact results. Yahoo would give me exact high quality results. Um, Google gives me a list of results that says, hey, I think these are pretty good results. You should check them out. Your answer is probably in there. And the big difference is that Yahoo computed its, its results. So it could scale. It could scale to the two and a half million websites. Yahoo couldn't do that anymore. And suddenly uh, it was no longer competitive. Roll forward another 14 years. And uh, Google was trying to, uh, in 2012, Google was trying to deal with 700 million web pages. And what they found is that people, because there were so many web pages, people became less interested in actual web pages and they were more interested in specific results from those web pages, specific answers. And that's where the knowledge graph came from. And what you see there is that you're now dealing with a combination of approximate results and exact results, a blending of, of, of um, crowd and computer results at the same time. And this, this, this is basically our, our global large scale data infrastructure that's there. But you can see the interaction paradigm is quite different. So what does that mean for, for us? Well, in terms of data management solutions, Franklin, um, Halvey and Franklin had this really good quadrant for trying to understand the challenges that we have with data management. They, they base it on two different um, dimensions. One is administrative proximity. How much control do you have over your data sources? Are they closely controlled or are they loosely controlled? And this basically tells you the, the amount of assumptions you can make in terms of data quality, data access, consistency, et cetera. And then in terms of semantic integration, the level of integration you can expect from these sources. So at the bottom left of this, you can see a database management system, which is our traditional data management approach. You expect to have high administrative prox uh, uh, proximity, lots of control, and you expect high levels of semantic integration. At the other extreme, you have web search, where you have low levels of actually of, of almost no coordination over web pages, but you don't expect high levels of, of integration either. And this gives you the dimension of being able to think about the uh, the problem in those terms. So by looking at approximate and computing, um, um, approximate and best effort approaches, such as search, are we able to actually lower the cost that's actually uh, involved with data management uh, approaches? Are we able to now uh, tackle more of this long tail by using computation as opposed to looking at humans uh, modeling up and connecting those different data sources? And this is the notion of data spaces. So a data space is not a data integration approach, but rather they're an approach that supports data coexistence. So the goal of the data space is not to is to kind of provide base functionality over all of your different data sources, regardless of what the levels of integration that they are. So it's a space that you can search and use computational services to be able to understand your data more, um, but you're getting approximate um, and, and computer results as opposed to exact results. We applied this paradigm within, within our own one where we looked at linked data and knowledge graphs. We brought them together. Um, with uh, entity-centric and real-time uh, querying capabilities and stream processing. And, and we developed a set of principles based on the original ones from Halvey that said, look, we, we recognize in our smart environment, we have lots of different data sources. So we need to be able to support the sources in different formats. We don't subsume any existing original system. We're not there to, to extract all of your data and have it in a new system, but rather we work with the data where it exists because we recognize the original system is still there and won't disappear. Um, all our queries are best effort and approximate. And then we provide this idea of pathways to improvement. How do we slowly improve this data over time? And then when we look at how we apply this in, a, in, a, in our ecosystem, we have our different things and, and um, within the environment. We have our different data sources that we can, can connect with them. We basically model them all using knowledge graphs that give us this layer of, of managed entities. And then we can build our applications on top of that. So it's a very um, kind of simple layered approach. And the key challenge for us and the key, um, the key research opportunities is in developing these support services that basically provide different types of um, different types of support over this um, data space that we have. And, and, and this is really the challenge that, that, that we look at. How do we actually 
investigate techniques that enable us to be able to provide these approximate and best effort support services over this loosely integrated set or, or uh, a loosely uh, coordinated set of data manage, uh, sorry, uh, data so sources. So what I'm going to talk about now is just uh, one or two techniques that we have for that in the area of question and answering and one for event processing and then, then I'll, I'll finish up the, the talk. So, so the challenge that we have is when we look at, at, at semantics and data models, data models are typically developed in the lab under very formal settings, very rigid settings. But the reality is when you go to the real world, everything is messy, uh, data quality is out the window and legacy data is, is the most joyous thing to work with. It, it, it really is uh, very, very challenging, which, which makes it difficult um, to work over time. You have to recognize the fact that the real world is very messy. One key technique that we use is, is basically the distributional semantic um, hypothesis. Uh, which, which basically says that if you look at a, a particular given word in a piece of text, by looking at the words that are also in that piece of text, you can actually understand more about that word in terms of its relationships, and you can build an interpretation vector. So this is a very simple example of the distributional hypothesis developed by Firth in the 50s that basically looked at the occurrence of the term uh, wife within an encyclopedia and builds an interpretation vector to help us understand what are the, um, what are the different possible uh, associated words, related words to that. What's really useful with, with the distributional model is that it's entirely computational based. So you can take a large uh, text corpora, analyze that, build a vector space to understand these different terms and understand the weighting between those different terms, and then build different types of interpretation vectors using different analysis over this. So this one is ESA, explicit semantic analysis, and there's lots of different, um, there's lots of different ways of, of building these interpretation vectors. What's nice with this is that the model, this model actually gives us basically a way of trying to do semantic interpretation within our communication systems. And it's a real key, key tool to, to act as a broker between the different producers and consumers of information within the system. What would this look like? So if you wanted to perform a query on a data space, we might have a query provided by a user that asks who are the, cheery, uh, who are the children of Marie Curie married to? And we look at the different representations that actually exist within our data space. We can see that in these three different graphs, that information is there, but it's, it's represented in different ways. It's not integrated uh, together. So what we can do is we can basically look at our, our large scale language um, uh, corpus, analyze it to build our vector space, use that uh, vector space then to, to actually index our database that we have our different graphs, we have our different graph models, and then we can actually perform a query and be able to uh, answer it. So, so that's a one very, very simple way of doing it. To give an idea of what that looks like for our previous example, we're using the distributional semantic model. Effectively, you could call it a digital language, um, a digital twin of language to, to bridge the semantic gap that exists between the query of the user and the actual representation of that information within the graph. So it becomes a matching process as we go through it and we have various different techniques to do it. That's for question answering. Within distributed systems, we've applied the same, um, the same approach to some uh, to matching uh, event streams. So, so this is an example of a publish subscribe system where you might have events produced uh, on, on the, the left here, but they want to be consumed by, uh, by um, subscribers on the right, but they might be using different terms to do it. And again, by looking um, over, over the, the, the broker overlay, we can basically do this matching that exists there. So we, so we can introduce, um, actually, sorry, there's a mistake there. This is the open pub someone here. So basically by introducing, um, uh, an approximate semantic matcher inside a publish subscribe system, we can actually introduce that level of, of matching so that people can actually um, exchange information uh, more simply. If you look at the performance here, it, it's interesting to look at it because the trade off here is that you don't need to worry about data integration. However, you're only going to get at best, you know, 84, 85, 86% performance. So it, it, it's an approximate result. You don't want to fly an aircraft doing this. You don't want to do heart surgery doing this. You don't want to run a traffic system doing this. But it is an interesting first step to deal with a large stream of data that's coming at you to be able to analyze it and understand what might be relevant to the query that I'm looking at. So again, the same way, if you're searching for a doctor on Google, you don't necessarily click on the first link that you see, but you might study the links to understand which one is useful for you to work with. So Ed, does that, is any of this useful? I've got about another three or four minutes, Fabio, just to give you an idea on time. Um, well, we have deployed this. We had five different pilot sites across Europe. We deployed it into the Lenati Airport in Milan, a couple of uh, buildings uh, within Galway, where I am in, in Ireland, and also a collection of homes in Greece. And specifically in these pilots, what we wanted to do was to help people 
uh, and, and the, the different organizations do smart energy and water management. So going back to that smart environment challenge that we had, in each of these different environments, we have lots of different people who wanted to interact with the data space and look for different types of information. So you've got corporate staff and operational staff that might be looking at the cost usage associated with energy and water. You have families that are maybe interested more about, well, how much is mommy and daddy using today to, to run the house? You have um, passengers in the airport that might be interested. What's the environmental footprint of me using the airport as I'm passing through it? So you, you have lots of different users that have different queries and want those queries answered in different ways using different types of interfaces. We were able to use our data space to bring together all of the different sources in these pilots. We went through our, our OODA loop, again, for, for building our digital twins, and we developed different types of support services for each stage to be able to, to help us bring together um, the data in an easy way for, for, for the users to be able to work with it. We built lots of different dashboards based on that then. So each of these are powered by queries that are provided by the data space, and the data space is all computationally driven, but it gives you a, a nice idea of some of the things that could be created, everything from um, personalized energy usage and water usage down to notifications on smart devices or notifications to, to administrative uh, or operational staff that are running the building. Um, the pilots themselves were quite successful um, in terms of energy saving, water saving, but also cost savings as well. And the cost savings are really critical for this because these were real pilots. We were working with real users and we had to justify why do you need to integrate all this data to do data driven decision making to save money? Um, we had to be able to show by, by doing this, we can actually um, save you money that justifies the investment up front. And that was one of the kind of key learnings that we got. So some of the experiences that we got um, from, from deploying these data spaces is that, well, first of all, most of most developers um, out there are not used to working with the notion of approximate results. So the talking about Google and approximation was quite important, but they're they're very they're very much um, they're not maybe formally trained in things like information retrieval, but they are trained in things like database management. So, so that was something we had to get across them at the start. The notion of the incremental data management by basically doing this as a pay-as-you-go model worked incredibly well with the agile software development model because it allowed us to break down the data management tasks into smaller ones that could actually fit in to uh, iterations um, and it became much easier for them to plan and to work with it. Um, and the other thing that we found is that by, by breaking out the, the tasks into more incremental approaches in the data space, um, it became a lot easier for, for, for non-technical users to understand the investment decisions that were needed. Um, and, and also allowing them to invest a little bit and see some results. So when we think back to that transforming transfer project, the big challenge there was how do you justify the upfront investment? Well, the data space approach allowed us to break that down to say, well, if you invest a little bit, we can show um, answers to these queries that can save you this amount of money or potentially save you this amount of money. Let's do that. Let's see the savings and how that justifies further investment to, to bring more data into the data space or to, to try to improve the integration of the data that's there. So in, in conclusion, um, basically, I, I think if you want to build these next generation of data platforms that will change the world, we need to directly think about how do we support data sharing? How do we simplify it? How do we look at different paradigms that are not just traditional ways towards data management? I've talked a little bit about one approach today, data spaces, which tries to look at pay-as-you-go data management. And the notion here is to complement traditional approaches, not to replace them. If you can fit everything into a database table and you can model it, and it's nice and cheap, do that, fantastic. This is for scenarios where you have so much data and you've got no resources to be able to do that. Look at the computational approaches as a first step to do that. And then the key to, to be able to achieve that in the data space approach is approximate and best effort support services. This enables us to have this loose administrative proximity. You can just uh, make the data available in the data space, and then you, you use computational methods to try to integrate it or, or to bring together those best effort results. And that leaves us with, my interpretation of, of, of Gibson's quote is that the future is already here, but it's really down to us to make sure that we evenly distribute it and that we build infrastructures for society that allows everyone to be able to access that data, to be able to use it, to reinvent their futures and to reinvent the, the future of our society. And while I've presented all this myself, the people that really done the work are the team, the students, the colleagues, the staff over, over many years and really all, all credit goes to them. And, and I, I, I've loved working with each and every one of them. Um, and we, we, we published an open access book on all our work in, in real-time link data spaces last year, available online, um, happy to answer questions. And I can see I'm about 35 minutes in, which is a little bit over, Fabio. Perfect. Okay, great, nice talk. And I think you are not only 
making, distributing the future. I think you are creating the future. Very interesting work. Uh, we, we have a couple of questions here. Um, I, I will read one was sent privately to me by Dr. Alessandro Santiago. He is a question about smart cities. He says that smart cities are now starting to use operation control centers. I know that actually Alessandro worked in a operation control center for the COVID crisis in Sao Paulo. Uh, he said the cities are starting to use these control centers to per supervise the cities and the data become the focus the data becomes the focus for this environment. How do you understand the function and the role uh, from big data for this smart city scenario? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, I think so. I, I think it's incredibly important. I, I, and, I, and I think the great news is that cities, um, our, our cities are, are recognizing it across the world that the need to understand their operation. Like, like a city, a city is not something that's really designed. It, it's, it, it's the ultimate complex system. It has emergent behavior. There are some plans that, you know, the traffic management should work like this, but it kind of maybe, you know, evolves through the day. It, it's adaptive. Um, cities can be quite resilient. And, and the role of data is critical to do that. I, I think obviously city needs, needs operational centers and they, they need as much data as they can possibly get. And the challenge becomes is once once they've built their systems, how can you share that data with as many other organizations within the city that actually could use that to improve other aspects of the city as well? You know, so, you know, there's one thing to, to look at the city management in terms of water and transport and energy um, and security. But maybe people are, want, want to look at other aspects as well. How do you engage other organizations to leverage that data collection that's been put in place by the, the control centers and those organizations? And make it easy for for other people to contribute data to that, or for them to share the data back, and and, and that's where where I think that that you know at the moment it's very operational, but I think this will be a societal service. Like I really believe we will, we will feel that our our the city government will invest in a digital infrastructure. That infrastructure will feed those operational centers, absolutely, but it will also feed community groups. It will feed. Um, it, it could even um, support the um, social interactions of citizens. Um, I, I think that, that that that's the sphere that we're going in, in now is, is how do we how do we get everyone access to that level of data and that level of intelligence about their city, their environment, their house, their life, their health, their families' interactions, et cetera. So I think it's 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 um probably thinking ten years down the line, but I think that that that's what we 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 need to take that notion and, and move forward with it. And I think that the, the technology you are developing goes much beyond these control centers because, as you said. Uh, when you allow a human being to do a query in natural language, a query that will be answered by looking at different uh, data uh, sources and, and combine it and bring a, an answer back to the user in a friendly way, this opens a lot of possibilities for public policy making, for NGOs that are working on the city, for the citizens themselves to to learn about uh, what's available in the city or, and for participate in the, the public policies of the city. So uh, in a certain way, it democratizes the access to data and what can be done. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and just while you said that, Fabio, that, that uh, question answering system was done by um, uh, one of my old students, uh, Andre Fritas, who is actually from Rio, now a professor okay. in University of Manchester. Uh, so a shout out to... Uh, a, br a brilliant Brazilian collaborator. <laughs> mm -hmm. Cool. So Professor Luis Bittencourt asked about digital twins. He said that digital twins alone are a challenge, but how do you see the challenges in coupling multiple digital twins? How to tune, tweak, data exchange among digital twins? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I, I, that, that's, a, that's a really good question because what, what you find is when you build a twin, depending on who's built the twin, they, they have this um, conceptualization problem that exists with all data because that twin is potentially modeling, it depends on what I was talking about, it's potentially modeling one person's perspective of how that system works. So, so for something that's physical, I, I think twins, you can get more agreement on the physical thing, but if you start looking at a digital twin of a community, okay, so you have a community, 
you have the buildings, fine. You have the cars, fine. You have the roads, fine. But what about the people and the interactions of the people? For example, now with uh, COVID, most of these models are in fact digital twins, poor digital twins of, of um, uh, well, they're effectively multi-agent systems to try to predict interactions between people to see how the, the disease will spread. But it's, it's effectively a digital twin. So, so the, the, the big challenge with the twins is, again, the data integration challenge because each of them are designed potentially independently. So how do you make it easier to, to share that data? I, I think it's, I don't actually have a good answers to that, but I think the fundamental problems are going back to the, the data management challenges that exist with them and the need for more shared conceptualizations um, between people when they're building them. Okay. And then we have a last question by Zeke Domit. He asks, you said that we can afford to search for gold nuggets with our bare hands. We did, uh, we cannot. Uh, we need an industrial approach as data sets start to get massive. How would that be? How can data trained AI search and select valuable data? Yeah, look, this is the challenge. So this keeps all of us professors, researchers, postdocs, PhDs in the job. But what I say to you is, is, you know, if you think of think of that example with Yahoo, okay, so like Yahoo was all about looking for the gold nuggets, you know, because your people had to, here's a great website, it's about Liverpool, I'm going to put it into this category here, here's the nugget, and I'm placing it where everyone can find it. Um, the computational approach that, that was brought by Google fundamentally changed that. Um, so the, the, the computational approach allowed us to be able to search much vaster um, quantities of data. But the, the trade-off was the interaction paradigm. You know, we, we didn't expect to get those exact results, you know, and, and that, that's the bit that we have to think about. How do we now educate our people, educate general people, um, citizens to understand this notion of approximate results and understand that data quality varies as well. And not everything that you see on a computer screen is true. Like th this is, a, and it also goes back to not only general people, but engineers, system architects to, to, to start looking at approximate and best effort approaches to do it because that allows us by having that trade-off it allows us to be able to, to use a lot more of these computational methods um in addition to the to the to the traditional methods that we have okay joe so ju just to finalize i won't say anything i'll just read what professor rirata wrote he wrote thank you ed for this very nice and inspiring lecture so thank you very much uh, i appreciate really that. really wonderful so hopefully next time you'll be able to join us in Brazil in person. Absolutely. I really look forward to that. And thank you all for your time. Um, I'm happy to have any chats, happy to have collaborators from Brazil come visit, work on stuff, because uh, um, uh, there's a lot to be done. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you.